On March 20, 2003, the United States and its allies invaded Iraq. The pretext was alleged weapons of mass destruction, which did not exist. 20 years on, what did Iraq get out of this? And what stands in between Iraq and its post-war reconstruction efforts? I'm Li Chou-Yuan with CGTN in Beijing. Thank you so much for joining us for this joint program with Rudal Media Network in Erbil, Iraq. Greetings, Chiliwan. The toppling of the Saddam Hussein led to that decisions in Iraq were no longer made by one person or one political party. It diversified the decision-making process and made space for more inclusive voices. But there are shortcomings. I'm Shahiyan Tahseen. I will be partaking on this joint program from Erbil with my colleagues in Beijing. Thanks, Shahian. Joining us here in Beijing today, we're pleased to have with us Professor Teng Jianqun, a research fellow at the China Institute of International Studies in Beijing, and also Einar Tangen, senior fellow at the Taihe Institute and chairman of Asia Narratives. Great to have you with us. And here in our studios in Erbil, it's my pleasure to have two experts with me, Tanya Gili, former member of Iraqi parliament and expert of Iraqi affairs, and Siobhan Fazil, researcher at Peace Center in Stockholm, Sweden. A big welcome from CDT in Beijing as well. 20 years ago, the U.S. launched a punishing military air assault on Iraq. It was widely condemned as an illegal war of aggression. It's also been described as America's biggest strategic mistake since the Vietnam War. Well, two decades later, U.S. troops are back again, despite being ordered to leave by Iraq's parliament. The invasion and the chaos it unleashed killed hundreds of thousands of people and tore a nation apart. CGTN's Nathan King looks back. Saddam Hussein and his sons must leave Iraq within 48 hours. Their refusal to do so will result in military conflict, commenced at a time of our choosing. 20 years ago, in the wake of the attacks of September 11, 2001, the U.S. began its invasion by launching cruise missiles and laser-guided bombs against leadership targets in Baghdad. Though no weapons of mass destruction, the public rationale for the invasion were ever found, military success at first seemed swift. <laughs> After toppling, then capturing President Saddam Hussein, there was little post-invasion planning. Iraqi society essentially collapsed. The U.S. banned the former ruling Ba'ath Party and disbanded the Iraqi military, leading to an insurgency that saw U.S. combat deaths spike and the spending of trillions of dollars. Iraqis were angry at the U.S. Sectarian divisions marred post-Saddam politics. Civil strife led to a crisis bordering on civil war. In December 2008, one Iraqi journalist summed up the anger of many Iraqis by throwing his shoes at then-President George W. Bush. Three U.S. presidents later, Iraqis still remember the chaos of the U.S. attacks. During the war, we lived the bombing, gunfire and explosions with fear and anxiety. We were not comfortable. The situation is now better, and we remember the days of the war, but we hope they're gone for good. In 2008, U.S. President Barack Obama was elected due, in part, to the failure of the Iraq war. He called it dumb and vowed to bring U.S. troops home. Let me say this as plainly as I can. By August 31st, 2010, our combat mission in Iraq will end. But that created a vacuum quickly filled by ISIS, a radical Islamic group that moved in from Syria and conquered vast amounts of territory even threatening Baghdad. Some U.S. troops returned, and a bloody counterattack finally pushed ISIS back. The true death toll in Iraq may never be known. Estimates range from 100,000 to more than a million dead. In terms of the financial cost of the U.S., estimates range from $1 to $3 trillion, money that could have been spent on roads, schools, railways, and other big neglected projects. 20 years on, the main lesson that doesn't seem to have been learned by the U.S. is having the world's most powerful military that you can deploy around the world at a moment's notice doesn't always yield results. And in fact, here, 20 years on, few people talk about the Iraq war. And even on this anniversary, some voices here in Washington are starting to say, well, 
it wasn't the disaster it was made out to be. They point to growing GDP figures in Iraq over the last 20 years and the removal of Saddam Hussein. Meanwhile, U.S. troops still remain in the country. Nathan King, CGTN, Washington. And to get a sense of how Iraqis feel about the war and the situation the country is in now, CGT in and Rudal spoke with people with different opinions across Iraq. Take a listen. All of my people in Iraq, we first, we believed the slogans. We came to change your uh, situation to the better. But you see now, is the worst country in the world is Iraq. Where is my scientist where is my artist where is my my history there definitely has been major progress um, in terms of human rights for all the different diverse groups that live in Iraq, for Kurds, for other minorities, for um, different religious groups as well. Um, we also have taken a lot of steps forward um, in terms of education and opening up to the world in general. 20 years has passed and what is left from the great Iraq is the wounded one. Unfortunately, we remember a dark period of time. We were not living perfectly but it wasn't the worst too. Well, the fall of Ba'ath regime has allowed me as an individual to participate more fully in the political process of Kurdistan and educational institutions to grow. And if the Ba'ath regime was still standing till today, we wouldn't be having these, this autonomy and we wouldn't be having these opportunities. The political system in Iraq moved from a dictatorship and transitioned into a democracy uh, polit uh, political. And uh, the social uh, changes, I would say that um, there hasn't been much uh, social changes except for the fact that uh, Saddam Hussein uh, controlled the, the sectarian uh, conflict between the Shias and the Sunnis. And uh, since uh, Saddam Hussein, uh, uh, since his fall, um, the Shias and Sunnis, uh, th their conflict has uh, become uh, stronger. There is an exaggeration about the existence of social divisions within Iraqi society on the basis of Sunni Shias and Kurds. And this is what Americans say after 2003. This is not true because Iraqi society has coexisted for many centuries. And this problem was created by the simple mentalities that controlled Iraqi society in the post-war period and was encouraged by competing political parties. So as we heard there, people have different opinions about how much they like the Iraq today. But if there is one thing that people may agree on, it is the threat of terrorism, which challenges its safety and the security of Iraq and the world. And that's the subject, our next discussion. We want to start with Rudal. Thank you, Chil Yuan. 20 years on, threats on Iraq's peace and security have not ended. ISIS is one big, a big example that still poses a grave threat on the entire country. Our reporter, Halkaut Aziz in Baghdad, is with us to give more information about the number of ISIS terrorists left or remain and the areas they are active at. ISIS is still a threat to the Iraqi security. Five years ago, Iraqi government declared victory over ISIS, but there are still activities by ISIS remnants across the country. There have been four attacks against Iraqi security forces and Shia paramilitary forces within only one week in Kirkuk, Anbar province and Termiya near Baghdad. Iraqi Joint Operations Command says they have been able to contain ISIS remnants into a very small number. According to their statistics, around 400 to 500 militias remain in the country. However, security experts speak to a larger number of militias. According to the announcement by International Security Council, there are 6,000 ISIS militias remaining in Iraq. However, the security experts believe there are an estimated 2,000 ISIS militias remaining in the country. One of the problems that further deteriorated security situation in Iraq was clashes erupted between Iraqi and Kurdish forces in October 2017, which left a security gap for ISIS militias. In order to eliminate the threats, Iraqi and Kurdistan regional government have signed a new agreement. The agreement particularly intends to end ISIS in Kirkuk through declaring a joint brigade. 
The brigade is supposed to start operating in those areas right after the Iraqi facial budget was passed in the parliament. The brigade will improve the security situation in Iraq as a whole. But it's too early to say, at least for Salah Hadin, Diyala, Anbar province and Tarmia near Baghdad. Now back to the studios. Uh, for further information about this uh, topic, joining me in this discussion, Mr. Fazal and Ms. Gili. The overthrow of Saddam uh, Hussein was to end violence and dictatorship. But uh, after that, after the overthrow of Saddam Hussein, uh, Iraq fell into two great wars uh, against Al-Qaeda, against uh, ISIS, and uh, this continued violence, like it's going on, what's the main reason behind the strong uh, emergence of radical groups or organizations? Well, the military intervention in 2003 did not anticipate successive political developments and security developments, but mm -hmm. provided the conditions for that to happen. Mm -hmm. um, in the initial phase, which um, the Kurds actually played a crucial role, and with their experience of self-rule between 1991 to 2003, brought the different uh, groups of Iraq together, including the Sunnis and Shias. But the decisions in that phase included, for example, the disbandment of the Iraqi army and then the, the passage of uh, certain laws that certain parts of the country, particularly the Sunnis, took, off, uh, took a, a strong issue with. Mm -hmm. It led to a disenfranchisement and disillusionment of a major component of Iraq, Sunnis, uh, hence led to the uh, resistance to the U.S. intervention or mm -hmm. subsequent uh, occupation, but also to the rise of the, um, the extremist groups like Al-Qaeda and later on it is uh, successor, mm -hmm. the, uh, the so-called uh, Islamic State group, uh, which basically posed a threat to the entire country, mm -hmm. not least to the um, Arab part uh, of the country. So all of those uh, uh, initial developments in the initial phase uh, their implications, their ramifications, continue at the present. Uh, on the political level, um, the political system that was introduced was a consensual political system mm -hmm. uh, to encourage and incentivize Iraq's major three components, again, Shia, Sunni, and Kurds, to engage in peaceful relations. But we have seen that a lot of the, mm -hmm. uh, the constitutional clauses and, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that have been enshrined in the constitution that was ratified in 2005 2005 by large uh, segments of the population are still uh, yet to see the daylight uh, mm -hmm. and and in the long run uh, this political system have been uh, tested uh, so it's uh, for the ruling elite to mm -hmm. get back to uh, the promise uh, that was provided to all Iraqis in the initial phase so uh, do you think that Iraq only Iraq can um, face these challenges or fight against ISIS or any other radical group uh, well, I, I, I believe the onus is on Iraqi uh, leaders. Uh, mm. They need to get it right. Mm. Uh, the socioeconomic situation, for example, we've seen last year following uh, the early mm. elections that were seen by uh, experts as the, perhaps mm. the best elections that Iraq has had. Mm. The political paralysis went on for over a year and mm. almost uh, brought Iraq to the brink of civil war. Mm. While the country's needs a growing, mm -hmm. steadily growing population of 42 mm -hmm. million, and that's growing by 2.5% every year, their needs are taking a back step. Mm. Will they need, will they always need the help of the uh, coalition or inter international um, uh, society to fight against the radical groups? Yes, at this stage, I think they, they do require uh, help, whether it's technical assistance, whether it's training, uh, whether it's upgrading the weapons system, etc., I think it's quite important that we need to re to realize that the threat of terrorism mm -hmm. and ISIS, um, I may not agree with Kakshivan 100%, it's mm -hmm. not just an Iraqi problem, it's not just affecting Iraq, mm -hmm. but it's a geopolitical problem mm -hmm. where it's affecting this, the, the neighboring countries, mm -hmm. it's coming through from the neighboring countries, mm -hmm. etc. So what's happening is, unless there's a consensus and there is a, um, a, a joint... Uh, um, uh, effort by not just Iraq, but working with the different neighboring countries mm -hmm. to ensure that we can actually crush this, um, this terrorism, I think we will not be able to, to rid of it. Okay, sure. my final question about this topic is the Kurdish Peshmerga forces um, are a critical element in fighting 
against a radical group or any radical group in Iraq. So and they are legally a part of a uh, uh, defense system, Iraq, uh, Iraq's defense system. So, but they are not uh, provided with the uh, support and uh, which is required or needed. Yeah. So how can we uh, help in strengthening this element against any uh, radical group? So I think going back to, to the point that my colleague made is that, you know, what, the reason why we're having, the reason why the country is in chaos is because there are disenfranchisement of different groups. Mm -hmm. And the Kurds, unfortunately, you know, even though, yes, we were part of the, the change after 2003, pre-2003, it was the Kurds that brought the different sites together. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, and really pushed for, for this, this democratic mm -hmm. Um, ideals to be kind of imp uh, infringed in the constitution, etc. But what happened was, if the central government is not willing and is not ready to really work as partners with the Kurdistan regional government and with the Kurdish forces, the Peshmerga forces, I think we'll always have these security grabs. Mm -hmm. They're always going to be there and we're not going to be able to, to crush it. Thank you very much. We'll be back to you for uh, more uh, uh, discussion about this topic. Now, I go to Beijing with my colleague, Chi Liuan. Thanks, Chahia. Let's now take a look at some of the numbers involved in the terrorist attacks in Iraq over the years. The U.S. invasion led to a tsunami of terrorist attacks in Iraq. More than 6,600 attacks were recorded in 2006, and that number declined despite a surge when ISIL was at its height. In 2020, 629 attacks were reported. It recorded roughly 560 deaths compared to the more than 8,500 killed in Afghanistan, who topped the ranking. Now, I want to bring in our guests, Mr. Tong Dianjun and Mr. Einar Tengen. Einar, how big of a threat is ISIL now to Iraq? Well, it continues to be a, a threat in the sense that it's been pushed underground, but it's not dead. And as long as you have situations where people feel aggrieved. Now, remember, ISIL, although officially started in 1999, gained prominence in 2014 when it started its attacks, uh, was pushing uh, this caliphate that they put together. It be had become a symbol of terrorism uh, around the world. And, you know, part of that was due to the U.S. outside interference. Uh, they might feel that uh, the war uh, was a good thing, or at least it got rid of Saddam Hussein. Uh, but the Ba'athists were disaffected. They ended up, many of them went into ISIL. Uh, the figures that I have seen is that 80 percent of the people in ISIL in uh, Iraq were from Iraq. So, you know, to the extent that you have dissatisfied people who feel that they have been attacked, I mean, if somebody comes to your home, whether you think they're nice or not, no one wants to be occupied. So right now, at, at this juncture, it's a psychological thing. And I, and I, you know, China's position, as far as I know, is that they do not want to get involved in the interior uh, matters of different countries. But they are interested in things like SCO, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which puts together countries to fight common enemies like terrorism. Mm -hmm. So I think that will be the hallmark of uh, China's interests. Yeah, something that people can cooperate on. But what seems to be the biggest challenge remaining now in the country's counterterrorism effort, President? Uh, I think, uh, generally speaking, I, this is uh, not a single way for the government, for the people there to uh, find a solution to peace and stability. I think uh, if we look at the situation in Afghanistan, the withdrawal of U.S. troops might be a, a good choice for the uh, government to think about the peace and stability and the development of uh, uh, social life. So I think uh, if uh, we continue such uh, uh, you know, development in economy and I'm sure uh, the people there will enjoy their life and will return to the you know, normal you know, development of all the, you know, their requirements and also uh, some you know, social life uh, for the for the people, so I think at this moment the withdrawal of U.S. troops, the complete withdrawal of U.S. troops, might be a good choice for the uh, Iraqi government for the Iraq people. Let Iraqis you know, be themselves and find their own way out of such a dilemma, because they, you know, for centuries, they, I, I'm sure the the Iraqis are very clever to think about their uh, way for such a development, for the peace and stability of social life. Do you agree with what's being said there, Anna? I'm sorry, I'm, I don't. Uh, you know, the U.S. went in and broke Iraq. 
It was uh, based on uh, misinformation that, that was being spread. Uh, it looks like deliberately by the United States government that there were weapons of mass destruction. There weren't. None were ever discovered. So it was a complete lie. When you go in and break something, you own it. So I agree that troops should be out, but the U.S. has a debt to Iraq, which they are not honoring. Right now, it's all about the, the kind of oil that the U.S. can get out of there. It is not about rebuilding the infrastructure, bringing back uh, the 9 million people who have been displaced. There are 4,500 American troops who are lost in this. What have we to show for it? You know, over that period, $21 trillion has been spent all right, on wars, providing uh, guns and ammo. What has that accomplished? You, you have more terrorism than, rather than less. You have more instability, more danger, more refugees. You know, that $21 trillion uh, represents the majority of the, uh, the American debt, which is at $31 trillion. And that money had been used for uh, mm -hmm. climate change, mm -hmm. for education, for social development, for trade. Just think where the U.S. and the world would be without uh, this kind of intervention. And it's, it, this will stand as a testament to the fact that when countries go into other countries, whether it's lies or well-meaning, it doesn't work out well. And just how is the security situation affecting the country's effort to rebuild? Uh, it's, it's a condition for the development of any society, even Iraq. If we can uh, see the situation in Iraq, we can find the, just because of the traditional order of society uh, was completely destroyed by the military, by the uh, foreign countries, and the uh, new order of society or system of society you know, has not been yet established. So there is no order, no system for the management of, of the society and for the development of its economy and everything. So I, I think at this moment, security, of course, is a condition, but security mainly uh, comes from the you know, development of the society, the order of the society. So it's very important for, for Iraqis to think about how can they establish new order of uh, power, of order, of society. This is very important for mm. the people there. So with that said, I'd like to move on to the second part of our special program today and take a look at the country's effort to rebuild despite all the security challenges. And domestically, externally, Iraq need to be rebuilt. And reconstruction is not just about putting up concrete structures. It's also about rebuilding the economy. And here's a look at some key economic indicators in the past 20 years for Iraq. The GDP took several dents, mainly in 2003, 2009, 2015, and 2020. The GDP growth rate has fluctuated, with the lowest data recorded in 2003 at negative 36.7%. Unemployment has been going up since 2020. The unemployment rate reached 16% in 2021. Inflation hit a high in 2006 at 53%. The figure remained low in recent years, but recorded a 6% uptick in 2021. So let's get more perspective onto this. Einar, let me start with you this time. 20 years after the Iraq war, the country just has seen so much sectarian violence, terrorism, the rise and fall of ISIS, unemployment, dislocation. What seemed to be the biggest challenge now uh, when it comes to rebuilding the nation? Well, I'm going to agree with uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Tang. This is a situation where they have to restore the society. When in 2003, when the war broke out, 50% of all the doctors moved away. And that was true with the professions all across the board. Uh, university professors, engineers, all of these people fled. Uh, and they're not returning. It's very, very difficult because the conditions on the ground are not good. I mean, the infrastructure is destroyed, as you just pointed out. It's hard to have a, a decent living. You, you know, it's kind of chicken and egg. How do you get people back if you don't have an infrastructure? But how do you have an infrastructure if you don't have the people to build it? Mm -hmm. So at this juncture, you have a rapidly, uh, the population is rapidly increasing, but they don't have the basic um, human resources that they need uh, to get this done. I, the other issue is uh, outside interference. As long as that continues, there cannot be any kind of stabilization within the country. Iraq is up to the Iraqis. It has not worked when others have interfered, and it's, it, it's not likely that it will. So, yes, I agree, troops out, but the U.S. has to own up to what it's done. There should be billions of dollars set aside to repair 
because they, they can't undo the deaths and the dislocations and the tragedies that happen. But they are uh, morally and I would say legally responsible uh, to make sure that they pay for what they broke. Another challenge is to diversify Iraq's economy, isn't it? The consensus is that economic diversification is an urgent priority for the country. Yeah, I think at this moment the Iraqis should think about their uh, cooperation with international community. For example, uh, the reconstruction of some uh, basic uh, facility infrastructure uh, for that country. Of course, there are a lot of uh, opportunities for the foreign countries to be involved in the reconstruction of that country. And uh, the number one job is to find uh, a peaceful and stable way to go ahead because uh, without uh, peace and stability uh, in that country I'm, I'm sure the foreign countries uh, will be very cautious being involved in such a reconstruction of the, that country. Yeah, a lot of economists insist that uh, diversification of his economy is, is a key here. Uh, the country should have a larger private sector but um, that hasn't happened just yet. Well you know it makes me angry to hear that kind of stuff because quite frankly, you, who's going to go there? As you know, you, you literally, you can find engineers, uh, people who can do this, business people, to go to a country that's been torn down, where the, you know, the, the roads are nearly impassable. You don't have uh, the kind of schools and infrastructure that you need. It's estimated that 70% of uh, Iraqis do not have access to clean water. Uh, 80% don't have access to uh, sanitation that they need. So, you know, you're talking about a country that's been bombed back to the Stone Ages and they keep talking about economic diversification. I, you can't do that until you have a working economy. I, and that's why, I, you know, it's very frustrating to hear that kind of stuff. What about in the future? Could that happen? Because if you look at other oil-rich countries like the UAE, they have diversified their economy and developed manufacturing sector, travel or tourism sector. Is that something that we could see in Iraq in the future? Tourism? Are you kidding me? Oh, come on. It's a beautiful country, but it's been literally, you know, destroyed. Uh, in terms of uh, revenues, the largest source of revenues are oil revenues, but those are in dispute. And there are real questions about how that's being handled. Mm -hmm. So at, the, at this juncture, until Iraq comes together, takes control of its own revenues, mm -hmm. and is able to uh, start trying to rebuild its infrastructure and then rebuild its economy, mm -hmm. uh, there's not much that can be done. And if you look at the younger generation in Iraq, these people, they want to build a better country, a better mm -hmm. Iraq. Mm -hmm. And there have been huge protests on corruption. They are calling for better governance. That's mm -hmm. the hope of people. Yeah, this is another issue for the government to, to uh, mobilize the support from the young generation in that country because the young generation are uh, very, you know, uh, eager to find a way, to find a good job, to find a good opportunity to uh, their, you know, uh, development. So I think the young generation might be a uh, uh, leading force, a key force for the uh, country uh, to uh, be a normal state. Uh, in the Middle East. And the factor of sectarianism. I mean, Iraq would know better about sectarianism and what this would do to a country. Um, the post-war constitution, which Iraqers, uh, Iraqi voters voted in 2005, pledges to create a country free from sectarianism and racism, discrimination, and exclusion. But how much of those constitutional measures have been implemented from your observation? Well, not enough. I mean, you still have a separation, uh, and it's not purely simple one against the other. Within each group, there are very, very different feelings about the the, uh, the future of Iraq, how it should be, uh, whether they agree with this non-sectarian clause. Uh, the reason they did it is because you have uh, three very, very different uh, major um, religious approaches. In addition, there are many other smaller groups out there. So it's very hard to, uh, to find a, a normalized basis uh, for that. But that is something that the Iraqi people have to decide amongst themselves and if they're going to follow it. But you, you, you know, we keep talking about a normalized country. You know, it, it's a pity that you, you, know, we can't, you can't go there and see exactly what the situation is. How you, we have a saying in the U.S., you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear, mm -hmm. right? You have to start. And right now, there should be money coming uh, mm -hmm. from the United States and the international coalition who went along with invading a country that they had no business doing. Even if they disliked the leader, 
all right? Even if the people say, well, perhaps we're better off without him, that was something that the people themselves had to arrange, not outside forces, because it has not worked either for Iraq or for the world. And the geopolitics of it. I think our guest in Iraq has mentioned it earlier. You know, some analysts say that this war has opened up a power vacuum, mm -hmm. just ripe for struggle between different players. How are you looking at this? How is the geopolitics of it affecting its reconstruction of the nation? Yeah, the invasion of uh, Iraq uh, by the United States actually is a result of the uh, geopolitical you know, consideration because the, 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 that region, uh, you know, has been very rich in oil and uh, some other resources. So this is not an um, issue of WMD, weapon of massive destruction. This is a, a geopolitical competition among uh, the countries in that region and also among the uh, major power in the world, you know, for, for, for decades. And uh, the uh, competition uh, has been there and I'm sure the competition will be there you know, in the future. How can Iraqi, you know, Iraqis can you know, go by their own way? That's the big uh, issue mm -hmm. the, countries, the, the countries in that region are facing. All right, that's the big question now. Over to you, Shahian. Thank you, Chi Luan. We will be discussing the same topic with my uh, two guests, uh, which are, they are uh, experts in uh, this field. Uh, we start with uh, the general question. Um, what's the obstacle or the main challenge in front of the reconstruction and rebuilding the country? Can I, um, yes, of course, uh, in one word, corruption. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think this is one of the things that, unfortunately, and I, I you know, I, I would like to make a comment about what the, the other guests in Beijing were saying as well. Um, you know, I mean, with some of the things that you're saying, I can agree with. I think the best thing that you said is leave Iraq for the Iraqis mm -hmm. and let us put the plans together. I think that's very important. Mm -hmm. But again, what we are seeing is that Iraq, unfortunately, has become aligned of, mm -hmm. of these competition between the different geopolitical powers mm -hmm. and this is exactly what is happening so when we're talking about reconstruction um, I think what the biggest obstacle for us has been is that putting together a plan that is implementable mm -hmm. that is doable without mm -hmm. looking at the interests of other countries and just looking inwards at the interest of Iraq mm -hmm. and the interest of Iraqis mm -hmm. but unfortunately that is something that we had not seen happen mm -hmm. and you know Iraq is a country that does have the human resources. We're a population of 42 million people. Yes, we have high unemployment. However, we have great talent, and we are seeing that. We're mm -hmm. seeing if somebody, and people can, and they are coming and visiting Kurdistan, by the mm -hmm. way, and they're coming and visiting Baghdad and other parts of Iraq. Mm -hmm. We just had the Gulf Cup and Basra. That was something that was quite successful. So, you know, to say that people cannot come and see Iraq for themselves, I really think that is not true. Mm -hmm. um, as a matter of fact, there are a lot of Chinese businesses that are here and uh, operating in Iraq in general. And I think that there are opportunities and uh, for foreign businesses to come in. But when uh, going back to the issue of reconstruction is that um, we have a problem in terms of the political system itself, that mm -hmm. Iraqis, we are not able or we're not able, ready mm -hmm. to get along with each other as we should. Mm -hmm. And I think this has been, and this is where we're seeing the corruption, we're seeing the political corruption, we're seeing the financial corruption, etc. Mm -hmm. These things are coming and then we have not been able to deal with them. How much it is important for the legislative and formal institutions to have a new plan or a plan itself for the construction and rebuilding Iraq? So Iraq recently just, or the, the, the current government just passed uh, uh, the, the new budget and it's mm. for three years. Yes. It's the first time we're seeing that the budget being passed in, in multiple years. Mm -hmm. And I think this was one of, um, this in itself is a positive thing because reconstruction is not a one year thing. It's not a two year thing. It has to be a long term plan. And yeah, I, it's very important that mm -hmm. there is um, uh, cooperation between the different institutions mm -hmm. and of the state, especially between the legislature mm -hmm. and, and, and the, the implementing or the government. Um, it's very important that they see eye to eye on these issues. Mm -hmm. So if we're looking at the current budget or the, the current budget bill that is going uh, to parliament soon, you know, it's for three years. 
and there, which means that there is an opportunity for them to be able to focus on the reconstruction mm -hmm. and not just, you know, focusing very much just on the military or on, you know, the particular just reconstruction of this part and that part. Mm -hmm. And one of the things also it's very important for us to talk about when we say, when we talk about the different governments that we have had and with different, with the parliament, you know, we do, we're, we, we, all of us want to have a very democratic system. We want to have an open society where people can speak freely, they can express their opinions. However, what we had seen, unfortunately, in the last few years is that Parliament and the Parliament was completely working against the government, even mm -hmm. though the government, you know, mostly a lot of the, the, the caucuses that were in Parliament were actually part of the government mm -hmm. as well. So there needs to be an understanding and mm -hmm. there needs to be plans in order for, for both of them to work together. In the past, in 2005 and 2006, there was more um, homogeny between parliament and the work of the government, mm -hmm. um, which may have led to, to some things in terms of the reconstruction, but mm -hmm. recently we haven't seen that. So it's very, very important that we, we all agree. On the other okay. hand, we have another threat I think, uh, Mr. Fadel, this, this, do you have a say on this? I wanted to actually relate it to that very important mm -hmm. comment. It's also the lack of continuity from one administration to another. Mm -hmm. We've seen as, uh, for example, in recent years, we've seen uh, the rise of protest movements in Iraq, mm -hmm. as a result of which governments in Iraq tend mm -hmm. to be short-lived. Two years at best. Mm -hmm. We've seen in 2018 that only one year after the government of former Prime Minister Adel Abdul Mahdi was brought down. Mm. So this lack of continuity when you have every mm. new government introducing grand new plans mm -hmm. rather than building on what the predecessor mm. has achieved also in recent years also the coming governments uh, initiate new grand plan strategies mm -hmm. etc. So that is all focused on reinventing the wheel rather yep. than actually building on what the predecessor has achieved. Why? Mm. Because some of these challenges you mm. cannot address them in four year terms or in two year terms. So you need to have this long term vision and longevity in order to address some mm -hmm. of these uh, uh, challenges. Now over to you HL1. Thanks, Shahia. Now, Iraq's central bank plans to allow trade with China to be settled directly in yuan. And up to now, it's had to be conducted in U.S. dollars. But Iraq has been facing a dollar shortage. China is Iraq's largest trading partner, while Iraq is China's third largest trading partner among Arab nations. So, Mr. Fadel, what do you have to say on that? Could you shed the, some light on the motivation behind this uh, move? Well, the shortage of uh, access to U.S. currency is twofold. First of all, is a technical one that basically uh, the demand is much higher for, uh, uh, for what actually the central bank is able to provide to the market. And mm -hmm. why? Well, because the U.S. and also other, uh, and also Iraqi government, uh, they want to have um, more access and visibility or actually, to put it in different words, to stamp out potential mm -hmm. allegations of money laundering and money basically being taken to uh, Iraq, Iraq's uh, neighbors that are under U.S. Uh, Treasury sanctions, such as Iran and, mm -hmm. and Syria. The other part is actually connected to Iraq's economy. Mm -hmm. Iraq to date doesn't have a viable banking sector. Cash mm -hmm. has remained the king. And of course, there is demand for U.S. currency because Iraq's economy is not a productive economy. I mentioned that it is over-reliant on oil. What do you do with the oil revenue? You need to buy and import pay for the imported goods and services that Iraq, again, is not uh, producing itself. So in the long run, to stamp out this currency challenge uh, is to basically to work on the, uh, diversifying the economy and mm -hmm. not to be uh, over, uh, over dependent on imported goods and services from, from outside, including Iran and other countries. Uh, Ms. Gilly, what fresh possibilities uh, does this, uh, the move um, introduce to China-Iraq ties? Um, Iraq-China ties have always been strong. I mean, uh, let's not forget when um, uh, the, the previous or two prime ministers ago, Adel Abdel Mahdi, when he went with a large delegation to China and there was the agreement that was signed between the two countries. We are seeing, as I said, that we're seeing more and more Chinese companies that are coming into Iraq to do, you know, to help with some of the reconstruction projects to provide services in our oil sector, et cetera. 
So I think that this, um, definitely Iraq is, um, even though, you know, it's, we've been, it's been 20 years since we had the, the Ba'ath regime and, you know, we were, were a closed country, but still we are still technologically behind the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. So um, definitely I think any openness towards um, other countries and other states that are strong and they can provide mm -hmm. the technical um, know-how or, or the technical training that we require for us to be able to catch up with the rest of the world, mm -hmm. that is all always welcome. So, and, you know, like as, as my colleague here said, mm -hmm. you know, diversifying the economy, but also diversifying the, 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 the currency mm -hmm. always opens up more opportunities. Well. Um, Sir Fazl, what do you expect for China's future role in Iraq? Um, what are the promising areas for more collaboration between the two countries? Well, as we know for a fact that uh, China is Iraq's uh, biggest crude oil uh, importer or buyer. Mm -hmm. And we've also heard uh, from, uh, 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 from the segment of the show that uh, China has uh, taken credit for breaking the, uh, the agreement between Iran and Saudi Arabia, where previously in 2021 and 2022, there were mm -hmm. negotiations in Baghdad between the delegations of the two countries. So that is all parts of um, Iraq's efforts to diversify it is, uh, it, uh, it is uh, foreign relations, mm -hmm. uh, to diversify its relations and to... Uh, resume peaceful relations for, uh, with its neighbors, be it in the Gulf or in the uh, west of the country with Jordan and Egypt mm -hmm. and, and, and so on. So in addition to the economic uh, um, uh, trade between uh, Iraq and, and China, of course, uh, Iraq's reconstruction mm -hmm. is, 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 is the mm -hmm. elephant in the room. Uh, and I believe uh, China mm -hmm. could play a role in, mm -hmm. in, 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 in basically overhauling the antiquated infrastructure mm -hmm. that Iraq is, is uh, Iraq mm -hmm. and its economy and its population is uh, continue to struggle from, and be it, for example, um, the um, building of large transportation networks, which the country uh, gravely needs, or reconstruction uh, of its uh, kind of um, schools, hospitals. And I know there are some schemes to build a large number of schools already uh, uh, going in. So the, all of these are uh, basically. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, avenues uh, and, and, and potential of, of potential cooperation between uh, China and, and Iraq. I have another question, which I want to take the comments of the two guests and experts in uh, the Beijing studio, Mr. Tang and Mr. Tangan. Uh, here in Iraq and Kurdistan, we want to know your answers and comments about what more can China do uh, for Iraq in the reconstruction, rebuilding uh, the country? Well, China has a, a robust program through the Asian, uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Obviously, they're dedicated to the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, they, they want to help, but they have been in the past. They don't want to be involved in the internal politics of the country. That is something, as uh, your guest uh, said, that is for the Iraqi mm -hmm. people to decide. So at this juncture, China stands ready. Um, as was said by my colleague, mm -hmm. uh, China is mm -hmm. not trying to force itself as being the arbitrator or mediator. They are there if it is the desire of the parties, all the parties involved, to have China involved. If they can do that, that's fine. As far as, you know, and a good example is uh, what happened with mm -hmm. Iran and Saudi Arabia. It is not a done deal, but you have to take that first step in order to have dialogue. Mr. Ten, mm -hmm. what's your comment on that? Yeah, I think this is a really a big opportunity for China and Iraq to cooperate in various areas. For example, uh, in regional affairs, uh, in economic cooperation, and also in some and, you know, uh, challenges, for example, the fighting against the terrorism. Uh, of course, China is facing uh, such a challenge, not, not only uh, you know, in China, but also in Central Asia, uh, we in recent years, you know, uh, very good at the cooperation with Central Asia countries. So I think uh, we have a lot of uh, areas to cooperate, and China, actually, to my observation, uh, has been a good partner to all the countries in the Middle East, in, in and in Central Asia. So I think. China can play a very important role in maintaining peace and stability in that region. Also, uh, gave some you know help for the reconstruction of Iraq. Thank you so much for all of you.
for my honorable guests here in uh, Erbil Studio and also in our Beijing Studio. Thank you very much for joining us. That's all from me. Back to Beijing, to my colleague, Chil Yuan. Thanks, Jahi, and many thanks to the guests with you as well. And with that, we come to the end of CTTN's joint program with Brudal Media Network in Erbil, Iraq. 20 years on, we've looked back at the war and explored ways for reconstruction, reconciliation, and cooperation. I'm Li Yuan in Beijing. On behalf of the whole team here, thank you so much for watching, and bye for now.